What's up guys, welcome back to Title Gardens. Buckle up because this video is about to get salty and I'm not exactly talking about the water here. So I've been at Tidal Gardens for almost a year now and after all that time I've photographed hundreds and hundreds of corals. If you've seen a picture of a coral on our website or social media in the past 12 months, there is a really good chance that I was the one who took it. After you photograph that many corals, you eventually figure out that there are some corals that just really suck to photograph. Whether it be the corals never showing up right or the fact that they're just really stubborn to work with, some corals can just be more challenging than others. So in this video, I'm going to give you my own personal top five nightmare coral clients and provide you with my own personal insight into how I just make it work. So without further ado, let's dive into it. So the first coral I want to talk about in terms of being the absolute worst are zoanthids. This may be a little bit of a surprise because in most people's home aquarium, zoanthids are just pretty normal and kind of hang out there waiting to be photographed. Here though, it's a little different because we don't shoot the corals where we grow them. We move corals from the farming tanks to a photo tank to get shot, and they are not too happy about it usually. The simple act of moving them can make them pretty moody, and they show this by pouting and staying really closed up. So from a photography standpoint, it doesn't give you much to work with. In addition to closing very easily, they stay closed for the longest time before opening back up, just adding to the inconvenience of it all. On top of all of that, sometimes only some of the polyps will open back up again in a timely manner just to tease you, while the other ones stay closed, so you still will aren't able to get your shot. One way to deal with this is just to kind of wait it out for a few hours or even letting them sit until the next day if you can. Clearly when you're on a schedule, that's not always going to work, so there are a couple of tips and tricks we've developed to help them open up a bit faster. The first tip is to give them a quick cleaning either by giving them a burst of flow from a turkey baster or if you want to give them a really good cleaning using a makeup brush. A lot of the reason why a zoanthid colony won't open is there is something on them that is bothering them. In many cases it is just some microscopic algae or a bacterial film and the coral is trying to shut off a thin film periodically. By helping them along in this process initially will close them up but they will open up much faster after being cleaned. The second thing to look out for is actual pest problems. Zoanthids, unfortunately, are one of the corals that somehow attract all of the bad bugs. There are nudibronchs, flatworms, sea spiders, snails, bacteria, etc., etc., that can keep a colony closed. So if you have a colony that is never open, it may be a more serious problem than just being uncooperative for photos. So that's the first coral on my list, zoanthids. The next item on my list are Acropora, but only a select few varieties. The varieties that are the worst to shoot tend to be the ones that get the most hype online, like Homewreckers, Orange Passions, and Walt Disney's. The reason these Acropora are so hard to photograph stems from the expectations people have for this coral. Let me explain. So online, when you search for these corals, they have a very distinct appearance. There's a very specific color palette that is expected for this coral, and if there is a lot of deviation from that color palette, people are going to think, well, that's not really a Walt Disney. Thing is, these super high-end Acropora are by far the most inconsistent corals when it comes to color. First off, these guys are like the stability mafia. If your tank parameters are rock solid, everything's going to be A-OK. -okay. But if for some reason your alkalinity dips a little or your phosphate jumps up suddenly, they could lose one of those signature colors. And those colors are going to stay gone for upwards of a month at a time. The other thing is, the color of these corals is totally light dependent. More so than other corals, in fact. Under anything but the bluest of the blue light, all those insane colors don't come out. I mean, at all. <laughs> in our farming tanks during the day, it is nearly impossible to tell the different strains apart. They are all kind of just greenish, beige, fuzzy sticks that look really boring. It's only when the daylight spectrum drops out and all you see is blue light that the rainbow colors of these corals actually kick in. Going back to photography though, these high-end Acropora are on my list because having to shoot corals under all blue light is a challenge. If you have seen our photography and videography videos, you'll know that LEDs are really hard to work with. The color spectrum in LEDs is a lot more limited compared to the color spectrum in a fluorescent light like a T5. 
But for these Acropora, you can't use a T5. That punchy appearance is pretty much an LED-only phenomenon. To combat that LED light dilemma without wanting to throw all your LEDs in the trash, to shoot these Acropora and get the best results, you can do a couple of things that might help. The first is if your camera has a manual adjustment for color temperature. When we're shooting stills with a Canon 5 DSR, we can dial up the color temperature to 10,000 Kelvin and shoot in RAW to give us the most color information possible. When we shoot video on our Canon C200, we can set the color temperature to 15,000 Kelvin, which really compensates for that extreme blue light. The other thing you can do if your camera doesn't have this option is to use an orange filter. We don't use them a lot here, but if your camera is limited, a filter can help quite a bit. Granted, that's not really hard to do, but it's just one extra step that you have to go through and one other thing that you actually have to buy in order to get the image that you want. There are a bunch of different types of orange filters, and some work a lot better than others in some scenarios. Our favorite so far that we've tried is a Tiffin 85B orange filter. If you want to get one for your camera, we will put an Amazon affiliate link in the description down below. Just make sure you get the right size one for your specific lens, because they do come in different sizes. Okay, so that in a nutshell is why fancy Acropora are on this list. Next up, number three. Okay, so this next coral also has to deal with color, and that is photographing bright yellow Fiji toadstool leather corals. There is no good reason why this coral should be as difficult as it is to shoot. When you look at it, it is a matte yellow color, no crazy fluorescence, no insanely blue light needed, but for some reason, this color information is lost in translation when you point a camera at it. When we pull up the photos on the computer, these leathers are almost always green. This leather is almost an opposite case to the high-end Acropora we just talked about. Any hint of actinic light and this coral photographs green. So when we are shooting, it's almost like we have to set everything to the most yellow setting while also adjusting the color temperature of the camera to something around five to 6,000 Kelvin to get into that ballpark. In person, the coral is a bright canary yellow and the brighter the light that is kept in, the more canary yellow it is. All right, so next on the list isn't a specific coral, but rather a certain category of corals that are a little bit more difficult to shoot. And that's corals with high amounts of movement. Corals in this category include things like Ganeopora, Euphilia, and Elegance corals. There's probably a few other ones, but I've found that these are the ones that move around the most. I will say, these corals are my favorite thing to shoot in terms of video due to all their movement, but in terms of photography, they pose some problems for that same reason. Since these corals move around quite a bit, I need to be shooting at a higher shutter speed in order to avoid any motion blur from the tentacles. That's pretty easy to do, but if I don't have enough light to compensate for how fast my shutter speed is, that's a whole different story. So I either have to bring in more light sources, or I'm going to have to play the flow dance. Now, what is this flow dance I'm talking about? Well, the flow dance has to deal with bouncing back and forth between turning the flow down or completely off to stop any fast movement from the tentacles, and then dashing back to the camera to take the photo before the coral deflates completely. Didn't get the shot you wanted? Well, time to go back and turn the flow on to puff up the coral again, and then turn it back off to start the dance all over again. This is mainly something that we found benefits torches when we're photographing them. Another thing that's slightly more difficult about corals that produce lots of motion is getting the correct shape that you want. Normally when I shoot these type of corals, I want them to appear full and balanced compared to being blown to one side by the flow and looking off balance. It just looks a lot more pleasing to the eye that way. This can also be achieved by messing with the flow in your tank. However, it is a process of trial and error for each type of coral. I've noticed in my experience that torches benefit most from the flow dance mentioned previously with very little to no flow at all, and corals like Ganeopora don't really need you to do that dance and are usually okay if you just turn down the flow a little bit. Same with elegances for the most part. Just remember to always look at your photo closely after you take it to see if some of the tentacles produced any motion blur at all, because it's always the worst thing in the world to put all of your equipment away, 
go to edit your photos, and then find that one tentacle smack dab in the middle of the coral has motion blur, and you have to shoot the whole thing over again. So yeah, it's great to have corals that look like they're dancing for you in your tank, but once you have to dance with them, it can prove to be a bit more that work than you anticipated. <laughs> So we're finally to the end of the list, and at the very bottom of the list is flower anemones. So flower anemones are a special kind of annoying when it comes to shooting them, and take the cake for most work needed for one photo. They're beautiful, don't get me wrong, but they are not a friend to photographers most of the time. For starters, they move around quite a bit. They're no sea biscuit, but they'll move fast enough to hop off their pedestal before you have a chance to get a great shot. You've probably seen how we photograph different kinds of corals, with almost all of them propped up on a pedestal to face the glass. But for flower anemones, you have to shoot them top down in a tub instead of in a tank. That's going to set off a lot of other problems down the road. So first problem that arises from shooting top down instead of shooting through an aquarium glass is dealing with a water surface. When shooting through glass, you are shooting through a stagnant transparent object, which is pretty easy to do. However, once you start shooting through water, it starts to get really tricky. Despite how still the water may seem, it will never be completely flat. It will always be moving slightly due to the movement of the corals, even if it doesn't seem like it to the naked eye. This slight movement causes light to refract off the top of the water in different directions, as opposed to the glass that usually only refracts in one direction because it is completely flat and stays completely flat. This refraction of light can not only cause your lighting to look really weird, but it can also cause the photo to look warped or blurry. Now, how do we solve this problem? What we use at Tidal Gardens is a little housing that goes over the lens of the camera that allows us to go underwater just enough to get past that barrier. You would assume this would fix our problems, right? Nope! In fact, it adds more issues, if you could believe it. See, we have solved the issue of the lens getting past that crazy light bouncing off the top of the water, but now that we are underwater, the light quality is less than great. The lens housing blocks out any lighting we have illuminating the coral. If you've been following along from our previous videos on photography and videography, you might be thinking, I'll just turn down the shutter speed to make it brighter, obviously. And I applaud you for actually listening to me, but there's one more teensy weensy little problem. Using a tripod is almost impossible. So we have to have it at a certain shutter speed to eliminate any motion blur from us holding the camera. At this point, you're probably thinking that I'm just a pessimist, and yeah, we haven't tried every available resource to try and use a tripod, but we've definitely had our fair share of experiments. We would probably have to get an extendable arm that attaches to the tripod in order to get the camera in the right position for this type of shot. So when we do try to shoot flower anemones, it's all handheld, and we try to stay as still as possible and try and get the shutter speed as close to 1 60th of a second as possible without making it too dark to be able to edit. It's quite the process, but we eventually end up with a photo that is usable after a lot of trial and error. So I know that I said there were only going to be five corals on this list, but bear with me for a second. This group of corals aren't like the other corals that I've mentioned, where the problem lies with taking the photo itself. These corals are actually really easy to photograph from a technical standpoint. The problem actually lies with the corals themselves. The corals in question are actually high-end strains of Montipora paloanensis, which include Kung Pao, Beach Bum, Rainbow Phoenix, and Vino varieties. Now, why are these a problem? Some of you may already know that these strains of Montipora look incredibly similar and are very sensitive to color shift, so their colors are changing all the time. So when I'm photographing them, they do behave very well, but do I know what I'm shooting? Not a chance. So if you look here at these web searches, you'll know what I'm talking about. They are all incredibly similar. If you take a picture of each of them and put them right next to each other, they will look distinguishable from one another. But if you only saw one at a time, it would be a lot harder to tell them apart. That's why we keep them so close together here in our tanks. We have to keep them very close to each other or we'll straight up forget which is which. All right guys, that wraps up my top five hardest corals to shoot. If you have any corals that you've had bad experiences shooting, feel free to leave some stories in the comments below. 
And also, don't be afraid to check out our merch store. We have new designs coming out all the time. We have some new Japanese style t-shirts and hoodies that have just come out, and they're pretty cool, probably some of my favorites. Check those out, and until next time, <laughs> happy reefing. And after all that time, I've fun fundraised? Where was I going with that? <laughs> out there waiting to be photographed. Photographed. That, yes. <laughs> photographed. I can put this little camera together. Don't mind me. First is if your camera has a manual adjustment for color cut temp. <laughs> Ugh. Bright yellow Fiji toasted leather corals. <laughs> but we eventually end up with a photo. Are you kidding me? On this. Oh wait, no, I have to change the photo. Huh. Talking about Montipora, but there's not a Montipora on my screen. Hold on. <laughs> if you look at the web shit, <laughs> what? What are we looking at? <laughs> For some reason, this color. <laughs>